Divine Truth Feedback Discussions Jesus, Mary, and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. This is Session 1, Part 1 of the discussion Forgiveness and Dealing with Those Who Harm Me, where Jesus and Mary give some personal feedback to Sandra Tsai about her questions relating to God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and address many common false beliefs regarding forgiveness, repentance, love, obligation, harm, and abuse. This session was recorded on the 19th of June, 2018, from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Welcome, everyone. I'm here today with Jesus. <laughs> Maybe. Hey, <Yeah>. I'm <laughs> really good. <laughs> Hardly seen you this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, today we're going to present a feedback session for you and this uh, in this session we're going to respond to a letter that we received from a lady called Sandra and it covers many misconceptions that exist on earth about the processes of forgiveness and repentance and also um, we're going to have the opportunity to address a lot of uh, false beliefs about love and obligation and how to respond to people who've harmed us. So we hope you enjoy our session. A lot of what we're going to speak about builds upon our series entitled Forgiveness, God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance. So we do recommend if you haven't already viewed those sessions, there's 15 in total, um, we recommend that you do that before watching the session because it will certainly uh, cover more comprehensively all of the points that we're going to mention throughout our discussion. Mm. Bearing in mind that there were 15 four-hour sessions <laughs> um, of forgiveness and repentance, which is 60 hours of material that we've done so far on the subject, um, obviously, you know, people are going to have a lot of preliminary... <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> of homework. <laughs> ...to do. But um, just one thing we'd, I'd like to say is that, remember Sandra was the person who emailed us right at the beginning that kicked off the entire series. So exactly. thank you for that, Sandra. A lot of the misconceptions you have about forgiveness and repentance we wanted to address in a more like detailed manner and that's why we did the complete session that we did because of course a lot of what sandra expresses is very commonly believed mm. by a lot of people on mm. earth which is why we thought it was worthy to respond to yeah yeah well before we get into our discussion i'm just going to take us through a quick review of the series that we did on forgiveness and repentance mm. So those of you who will have watched may remember that in our first three sessions, we discussed God's laws, God's truth, how to discern God's truth about anything, and then God's truth about forgiveness and repentance. Then in sessions four to eight, we moved on and had some great discussions about the laws of compensation. So sowing and reaping and what that's about and how that relates to our refusal to forgive and repent. Mm. So there we also introduce the concept of having to go through the compensatory laws because we don't have the desire to forgive or repent. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Then uh, in sessions 9 to 13, we spent a lot of time discussing the conscience, which is something that we hadn't presented uh, in a formal way before on, on video. Mm -hmm. And so we had some very interesting discussions about how the conscience operates and how it can assist us um, to begin to discern when we're sinning and when we're not. And uh, also to hear God's opinion on just about everything, which can help us with the forgiveness and repentance process. Yes, and then on the last two sessions of, our, of the entire series, we looked at more at God's role, didn't we? We did. Uh, firstly, God's role in, that he plays in the processes of forgiveness and repentance, but also how God feels about it. So hopefully by the end of that series, those 60 hours or so that we've done, people should have a fairly good picture, so although it's an in, what I'd classify as an introductory <laughs> course on forgiveness and repentance, they should have a fairly good picture of what's involved so that when it comes to answering Sandra's questions today, we, we, should, have a, be, we should be able to refer to those particular presentations and, and people understand what we're talking about. Yeah, we've, we've laid some groundwork anyway mm. for the preliminaries. Yeah. By way of introduction, uh, I'd like to just make a few comments about Sandra's, uh, the way we're going to approach Sandra's letter. 
So um, we should mention that Jesus and I have presented a full personal feedback session for Sandra in the past. Mm. And also we've had the opportunity to have email exchanges and personal discussions with Sandra about her personal emotion, con- emotional condition and what's currently holding her back in her progress towards God. Mm. So we're not going to really labor on about those same points in relation to Sandra anymore, but rather we're going to use her letter as a way to discuss some important principles that pertain to some of the false reasoning that she presents. Yes, I think that it's important to note that Sandra is very, very resistive when it comes to forgiveness and repentance, and even though she doesn't believe she is. And, uh, and she's also very resistive to dealing with her fear. Mm-hmm. And a lot of her fear comes out in her letters to us and her emails to us. Mm-hmm. And, and people who just shoot off question after question after question after question to us, which is what Sandra regularly does, mm-hmm. uh, it, it usually indicates that they're in a lot of fear that they don't want to feel. Mm-hmm. And they're constantly looking for answers. But when you give them answers, none of the answers will ever be satisfactory. So at the moment, any of the personal answers we've given to Sandra, not really very satisfactory to her. She keeps looking for new, you know, keeps asking new questions. And if she really had felt about what we'd said in our our answers, she'd be much more progressed uh, on these matters than she currently is. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to be aware of when we keep on shooting off email after email after email after uh, asking question after question after question even though we've already received a lot of answers to our questions and particularly even though we've already received a thousand hours of material Mm -hmm. beforehand because it well actually we've got nearly now two thousand hours of material on on the internet and that's an indication that you haven't really absorbed very much the answers to things rather than uh you know any other being there being any other problem and And that's something that we really do need to say to Sandra that, look, if you keep on sending question after question uh, without ever without ever actually feeling about the answers because you're in a state of fear and also in a state of anger, actually. Mm -hmm. So for Sandra, she's in a fairly large state of anger. And whenever we confront her fear, she immediately responds with anger. Mm -hmm. So so that's an indication that you know, somebody doesn't want to address their fears. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't want to address your fears, you are never going to be able to have a connection with God and you're never also going to listen to the answers you get. So, so you know, obviously there's a need for her to deal with fear as her primary emotion. So although today we're not going to talk much about her personal emotions, we just like to say that if you stay in a state of fear and you do not emotionally release it, and you justify continuing in the state of fear, you will not have a relationship with God. You will not be able to love and you will also not to be able to understand answers to your questions. <laughs> and so there are a lot of problems with yeah. staying in states of fear that we just needed to address in our introduction to this particular presentation. Yeah, yeah. because I agree that Sandra is actually very angry about fear and and there's a lot of anger as we'll hear in her letter Mm. and it's really a two-step process, isn't it? We have to let go of the justification of avoidance of fear and also deal with fear and at the moment her justification is like a force field deflecting any truth that we try to give her to assist her with the problems that she's having. Yes, and it's probably not correct to say that fear is her primary problem, actually, because her primary primary problem is her anger Mm -hmm. that she refuses to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And her primary problem is that she is using fear as an addiction. So she actually wants to retain her fear. And that is a that we we see most people on the planet and doing this where Mm -hmm. they want to believe in and maintain that they have a right to feel afraid. Yes. And that is an addiction. Yeah. And that addiction will prevent you from progressing and will also prevent you from ever being loving. So, so it's a huge addiction that is a big sin, actually. Mm-hmm. So if we look at it from God's perspective, fear is a sin. So, so the fact is God feels that it, God created the universe in such a way that there's no need for it, mm-hmm. no need for fear. And fear being the sin that it is creates a lot of evil, not only within oneself, you know, a lot of problems uh, in oneself, 
but also a lot of problems where we perpetrate problems to, you know and harm others with our problems so although Sandra is asking about how other people have harmed her mm -hmm. she presently is harming other people with her fear yeah. and her desire to hold on to it so it's very very important for us to state that up front so that there's no misunderstanding so although the questions that Sandra has asked are legitimate questions and need to be answered mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely that Sandra herself is probably going to benefit from those answers unless she addresses her addiction to remain in fear mm. but other people may benefit from these answers so, <laughs> that's, so, yeah. so that's why we're doing the session <laughs> i think this session has the potential to help a lot of people to challenge and confront their false beliefs about forgiveness yeah and people who harm us yes and how to respond yes and and the, and also understanding some very basic principles about love and obligation and forgiveness and repentance and what it, what it means to actually love because there are huge misunderstandings on earth about what love actually is and also huge misunderstandings about what forgiveness is and what repentance is too mm. so it helps us to address a lot of those in a practical way okay well now i'm going to read the letter from sandra and i'm going to read it in its full form but then what we'll do i'll read it we'll make some general comments but then we're going to break down the letter and respond to each of the sections really because they are each worthy of a lot of discussion okay so sandra says hi there spirits keep abusing me and telling me i only have two options and both appear to lead to a hellish outcome could you tell me if this is true not forgiving lets your enemies win but forgiving means that now you have obligations to love your enemies and to do for them do you mary jesus lena or anyone who, that has forgiven know this to be true have you had to allow someone that has harmed you to stay around you and enjoy your new self after forgiveness out of obligation to be loving I'm talking about those that have not repented, to, repented towards you at all, but feel that you have obligations towards them. They are superior, they believe you owe them, they've justified their actions towards you, and they believe that you are only lovable after you've forgiven them, because they judge the person that you were when you have certain feelings. And so now they feel that they can be loving towards you once you're a new person. I wonder if you've had to keep unloving people in your life after you've changed since they believe that all their prior unloving behaviour towards you was your fault and once you change now you're in a position for them to love you. I have a big dilemma and I do not wish to have such obligations to them. Please help clarify this issue. Thank you. Let's make some initial comments about Sandra's letter. Mm -hmm. What can we say? There's a number of points for, for Sandra to consider first off, isn't there? Yes, well, firstly, a lot, I, f I feel if there was a good understanding of, of principles of love and truth, many of the issues she's raised in the letter would be resolved. Yeah. But I can see that for most people, including Sandra, even though people have listened for many years, some people, there's not a good understanding of love and truth. Mm. And that's because we listen to everything through the filters that we have, mm. through, through the filters of our own understanding. And frequently our own understanding is quite distorted and flawed. And as a, a result of that, we then assume we understand things that we do not yet understand. And letters like this demonstrate we don't understand them yet. So it's great that she's seeking clarification about some of these matters, mm. but it's very, very clear if you reread the letter about how much anger there actually is about forgiveness mm -hmm. and 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 also about things like obligation and love and those kind of issues well, she says things like it's letting your enemies win is forgiveness um that you have an obligation to love others uh she says you have to keep unloving people in your life and and lots of other comments that really are not true at all are they no they're not not only are they not true but but they are her understanding mm. of what love would do mm. which is a distorted view of love which mm -hmm. is what we've been talking about in the assistance groups the, the education in love assistance groups 
a lot of it has been about trying to highlight the distorted views of love that we have. Yeah. And here, here, this letter is highlighting a lot of distortions in the view of love mm -hmm. and what love would do. So that, that's the first thing. We need to see that, that that's actually happening. And, and also many of these questions are, are about her fears, actually, what she's afraid of happening if yeah. she does certain things. Yes. So in other words, there is a refusal to forgive as a, and the justification for that refusal is a lot of bad things will happen if I do. Yeah. Right. And even right at the beginning of the letter, she's blaming spirits for telling her these things when yeah. the reality is she believes them personally and she wants to believe them. Yeah. So, so even there, there's external blame at other people saying things to her, whether they're spirits or people on earth, where she wants to believe it has nothing to do with her emotional condition, which mm. is not true. So, so, you know, these kind of letters, which we get a lot of, by the way, all generally indicate that the person hasn't thought very deeply or felt very deeply about the truths they've already received. So it's very important for us to see that and say that right at the beginning. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sandra yes. also sort of demonstrates some, um, like a lot of false beliefs about the forgiveness and repentance processes themselves, you know. So, and, and I think uh, even after the 60 hours of material that we've already presented, Sandra would have the same level of confusion about these particular subjects as she had right at the beginning, mm -hmm. which, which is interesting in itself because it means that there is little understanding about the underlying principles of love that drive these processes of forgiveness and repentance, yeah. and also the benefits that such processes give to oneself ra ra rather than just to somebody else. So, you know, everything God does benefits us as well as others. And, and in this particular email that Sandra sent to us, there's almost no consideration of the benefit to herself. No. <laughs> <laughs> and there is no consideration to the benefit of self because she actually believes that there is no benefit to herself and that, in fact, her own state would get worse, as she says right at the beginning, get into a hellish place mm -hmm. uh, if she actually goes ahead and does forgive others for what they have done. So big indication there that there's a, some, a lot of false beliefs there. Mm. Yep. Just to pick up on something you mentioned in passing, you, you mentioned that if we have like fundamental emotional injuries to the way that we understand love, then we're not even going to understand the other material that you and I present, such as the forgiveness and repentance process. It's all going to be uh, distorted through this um, yeah. uh, uh, misunderstanding about love. Yeah. So that tends to indicate that we really need to look at our issues surrounding what is love and what isn't love in order to really be able to, to take in the rest of God's truth. Yes, and somebody who is in a large state of fear obviously has quite a, a large amount of issues with love. Mm -hmm. They don't think they do. Yeah. In fact, quite frequently, they believe that they are more loving than other people. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if you have quite a lot of fear, then you have quite a lot of issues about love that you need to resolve. Yeah. And, and Sandra does have quite a lot of uh, fear and justification of her fear. Yeah. So therefore, has quite a few issues of love to resolve. And, and, and because of her unwillingness to experience the emotion of fear, she is unwilling to actually listen to the answers that are loving. Mm -hmm. She would rather hear answers relating or, or, or that allow her to continue to relate to and justify her own fear. So she would rather have a fear-based answer than a truthful answer based on God's perspective. So that, that's an issue. That's important, isn't it? Because a lot of people tell us, oh, I'm being so attacked by spirits. But, but very often it's the case that, no, I'm seeking the guidance of spirits who are in a much darker condition even than myself because what they tell me helps me to avoid experiencing something or, that I is, feels uncomfortable for me. Yeah, yeah, or even more importantly, what they tell me feeds my addictions. And yes. in this case, I'm saying quite clearly to Sandra 
that she has an addiction to remain in fear because whenever you challenge that addiction, she gets angry. Yeah. And in the last assistance group she attended where I challenged her fear, she got angry. Mm -hmm. so that's an indication it's an addiction and she wants it. Yes. And so <laughs> she's got to start seeing that she wants to be afraid rather than just saying, I'm terrified, so therefore I don't want to do anything. She's got to start seeing that there are justifications internally as to why she wants to remain afraid. And, and many people are in this state where they want to stay afraid. Mm -hmm. They want to stay in the condition they're in and use fear as a justification to stay in it. So how much of Sandra's real emotions are fear mm -hmm. and how much of it is just an angry demand that she doesn't have to deal with the emotion of fear? Because it can be, it can appear that a person has this much fear, like a lot of fear when in reality they just have this amount of fear but a huge justification to not feel it. Yeah. And so it, they present differently. Yeah. Both, both you and I in the first century were tortured to death. We understand what it's like to have real fear. Yeah. You had many rapes throughout your life in the first century. I was abused frequently throughout my life in the first century, right from the childhood onwards, and sexually and emotionally and, and physically. So, so every single person who has ever had these experiences know what fear really is, yeah. and we don't justify it. <laughs> and yet Sandra's experiences are nowhere near how, how traumatic our experiences were, mm -hmm. and yet she, he or she is justifying it. So, so how much fear is there really there, mm -hmm. and how much of it is that she just doesn't want to feel the emotion of fear? Right, so you, you, that's where the real question comes in, doesn't it, most it, of the time? It does, and that probably leads us to the final comment we wanted to make on Sandra's letter, uh, just generally, is that Sandra's often a very poor judge of when she's being harmed and when she isn't, mm. and often she is um, uh, grappling with reality also in terms of she gets very entrenched with spirit influence and decides to believe that all kinds of traumatic things have happened or are about to happen. Or are going to, to happen. Yeah, mm. about to happen to her. And she, as you mentioned, she often feels she's being harmed when someone challenges her false beliefs or doesn't meet an addiction. And so we have to take that into account a little bit for Sandra personally uh, when we read her letter yes. and say, okay, we can talk about these things as general rules, but we are not... Uh, endorsing we're not necessarily agreeing that all of the things that she believes are happening to her are happening to her correct and and i think it's important to say that while the material she's raised in the letter uh, is worth discussing which is the reason why we've put a session or two into it, mm -hmm. it, it and it's very important to understand the practicalities when it comes to forgiveness and repentance so this is a great way of illustrating some of those practicalities. And there's a few other sessions that we'll be doing with different people, mm -hmm. feedback sessions that uh, will also help us illustrate more of those practicalities of forgiveness and repentance. But because um, she's al already in the state where she's in refusal to address the, f f the feelings of fear or to feel most of her actual emotions, it, it's, it's highly unlikely that this particular feedback is going to benefit Sandra herself mm -hmm. unless she gets out of that condition. So we would like to recommend to you, Sandra, you get out of the condition where you justify your fears and into the state where you're willing to feel the emotion of fear, because that's all it is. It's an emotion. It's not reality. You keep telling yourself it's reality. The spirits around you keep telling you that's reality as well, because you like to believe that for reasons and you have addictive reasons to believe it. And this is what we need to say to you is that unless you address your, you address your addiction to remain in fear, it's highly unlikely anything we say today will actually personally benefit you or that you'll even be able to listen to it. So, so this is important for you to, to, to address. You need to get through the addiction of fear mm -hmm. and into the, the, the obviously deeper emotions that are driving that addiction. Because it's also true though, isn't it, that we can have almost a facade of fear because it's a way that we perhaps felt we could uh, manipulate people as a child when we felt powerless. And so sometimes we don't even have as much fear as we think, do we? Or we want to, we want others to believe because um, we can see that if I just am always fearful, if I'm just 
always believing someone's about to attack me. It helps me avoid taking positive action in my life. It helps me avoid confronting other people in ways that maybe it doesn't even scare me. I just want to be liked or, or whatever it is. It helps me to be, avoid being moral, ethical and a number of other things. However, in Sandra's case, we must also say she obviously has had spirit attachments of some quite dark spirits, obviously allowed by her parents mm -hmm. for a, from a young age. And these particular attachments, she is now addicted to keeping yeah. because she doesn't want to go through the pain that she needs to go through when she breaks the relationship with them and they attack her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to go through that pain. So she maintains the addiction. That is the main source of her fear. These spirits are not able to actually do anything to physically harm her mm -hmm. unless she stays in the state she's in. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the so situation she's in if she stays in the state she's in and stays listening to their fears they will ev eventually put her or get her through manipulation to be in situations which actually trigger more of or create more fear for her and then she'll justify to herself the reason for not doing what she needs to do which mm -hmm. is to just to feel her fear so so these spirits certainly have uh, with sandra certainly have some large intentions, which we'll discuss later in another section. Yeah. But it's important to note that they have been with her since childhood. So, so while she is now, and as an adult, maintaining these relationships, it is going to be quite difficult for her to break them because she has been maintaining these relationships since childhood. Mm -hmm. How spirits can interfere with logic. So in in introduction, really, still to discussion of Sandra's um, letter, it's quite obvious to us that there's a lot of illogical reasoning going on in her letter. Uh, and as you just mentioned, uh, Sandra does, by her own admission and by our <laughs> assessment, have a lot of spirits around her all of the time, hmm. uh, influencing the way that she thinks and reasons. So how, we want to answer now the question uh, how it's possible for spirits to attack or abuse Sandra on the issue of forgiveness. Firstly, can I just correct the idea that she has a lot of them? Sure. Um, she doesn't yeah. have a lot of them. If, if she needs to live my life if she wants to have a lot of them. <laughs> I, I have millions of them around me at any one time. She only has a few uh, that have attached to her since childhood. So mm -hmm. very, there's very little uh, pressure aside from a couple of people in the spirit world are obviously in a fear position themselves and they feel that they are protecting Sandra from 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 damaging things occurring in her life and Sandra wants that protection mm -hmm. because she believes that damaging things are going to happen in her life uh, it, and the main reason why she believes it is she's basically been indoctrinated by these spirits to believe it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, actually she she has the ability in her day to day life to to actually avoid a lot of such circumstances and situations that would create fear and particularly the kinds of fears that we experienced in the first century. So, so the reality is that she has a few spirits around her from childhood that are causing this manipulation and, and because she has some very, very strong emotions surrounding not wanting to experience anything she's afraid of. Now, that is the, her emotional addiction, her desire to use fear as a way to, to not take action. Yeah. And that is also the addiction of the spirits with her. Mm -hmm. So she's in codependence with those spirits with her. And we probably should point out at this point that um, we're going to launch into the discussion about spirits, but spirits also influence us in a very similar way to the way that other people on earth who still have a physical body influence us because sometimes when we talk about this it's all woo woo oh it's so you know macabre or something but it's it's really not that different it's at no all. different it, in yeah. fact in fact if anything the people on earth have more influence uh because you know we can see them yeah. and we can hear them usually the spirits have less because we generally can't see them we oftentimes can't hear them, we can only feel them. Mm -hmm. And it's only through our emotional condition that they actually have influence. So, so in some ways we could say that if we refuse to deal with our emotional condition, which is what Sandra is doing, yeah. particularly with regard to this issue, 
then naturally these spirits will maintain their influence over us because that is the only way they can maintain their influence <laughs> over us. They, they can't physically grab us and make us do something. No. They, they, they can only influence us through our unhealed emotional state to do something. So, so it's not like they uh, have any uh, stronger influence over us than any person on earth. And in a lot of ways, their influence is less mm -hmm. than people on earth have mm -hmm. over us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's always the, the unhealed addictions within us that enable any kind of influence. Yes, and, and I must say that there are many people on earth who are psychotic with spirit influence, many people, yeah. but it is because they want to have that influence through the meeting of some addiction. Yeah. So every single person who experiences what is often called like mental disorders nowadays uh, are actually influenced in some way through their desire to avoid mm. an unhealed emotional condition. Mm -hmm. If they healed their emotional condition, whatever that condition be, whether it be their desire for power, their desire for approval, their desire for influence, whatever it is that they are wanting with, with the influence that they have with spirits. And once they heal that, the spirit influence disappears. Yeah. So, so, you know, and that applies to every single person on earth. So, so we, we've got to stop blaming the spirits for their influence. Yeah. And we've got to start going, hang on a sec. No, their influence is because I am allowing the influence. Mm -hmm. And I've got to look at where I'm allowing this influence to occur. Yes. Because I, once I stop allowing the influence, there can be millions of people surrounding me spiritually, which often is not the case because for most people on earth, they've only got a few spirits around them. Any mm -hmm. one person on earth usually has a few spirits around them, but not a lot of spirits uh, yeah. hanging around them, unless they're a person who power, has power or has responsibilities or has authority or, yeah. you know, potential. has, yeah, has <laughs> like what, a significant potential. Has what they okay. feel is significant potential f to meet whatever they desire, yeah. right? And yeah. um, for the average person on earth, it's not like that. So we're surrounded by spirits, sure. But it's not as extreme, even though there might be three or four spirits per person. Mm. It's, it's not an extreme amount of influence if we deal with our emotional condition. Yeah. But if we don't, obviously it will be. Yeah. Well, and perhaps it's, perhaps it's more correct to say that spirit influence occurs via our desires. Because um, in the Forgiveness and Repentance series, actually, we discussed the fact that all of us are influencers and being influenced. Exactly. Um, so if we have loving desires, love-based, truth-based, faith-based, humility-based desires, we're going to be influenced in a really positive way. If we have desires uh, such as uh, you've mentioned, and we'll talk a bit about Sandra's, desires to avoid things, desires to hold on to false reasoning, then we're going to be influenced in a negative way. Hmm. So, um, and the same thing occurs on Earth with the people we interact with as well and choose to interact with. Yes, but, and it must be pointed out here, as people would see in recent discussions we've had with spirits, you can see how frequently these spirits themselves are attracted to people on Earth. And you could also see that the logic that hmm. goes on within a person's um, reasoning is very much influenced by their emotional condition. Mm -hmm. So, so why do you hear certain types of people telling you things? It's because your emotional condition allows that kind of thought to enter you. So, so unless you address your emotional condition, you are going to have severe flaws in the, your ability to process things logically. Yeah. And this is where I see most people who listen to Divine Truth have severe flaws in their logic <laughs> because they, they d refuse generally to address their emotional condition in a sincere manner. Mm -hmm. And that actually causes them to have flaws now in the way that they see and perceive everything. So their false beliefs now pervade every avenue of their life and even pervade their ability to actually hear something. As people know who come along to our sessions frequently, they zone out completely of what's being discussed mm -hmm. and then they come back to it later when it's more acceptable. And, and this is a natural thing that people do. If you don't want to hear something, you just zone out. If you want to hear something, you tune in. <laughs> and, and when what you want to hear is, uh, you know, supports you, well, then you'll tune in. And if it makes you feel good, you'll tune in. If it, make, if it feeds your addictions, you'll tune in. But if it doesn't support you in, in, or you don't think it supports you, it, 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 you'll tune out. You, mm. You'll try to get away from what's being said to you. And 
if we could just clarify a little bit about the logic part of it, um, this is my understanding. When I have an emotion within my soul that I am, I have a strongly developed desire to not address, so it's an unhealed emotion, I've, I've desi- developed the desire to not address it. Because my soul is in charge, really, of everything, including the way that I reason, uh, I might be quite an intelligent person who's capable of logical reasoning on a number of matters. But as soon as I hit uh, a point of logic or a point of reasoning which confronts that emotion that I desire to avoid, then I have choices for sure but most often I choose to disengage with logic at that point because I value the avoidance of the emotion above the logical reasoning. Mm. Is that a fair statement? It is a fair statement, but it's worse than that. (laughs) (laughs) People don't understand that the soul has energy pathways. Mm -hmm. So, So when you have an emotion of a certain type, it blocks certain energy pathways inside of your ability to feel. Mm-hmm. When you have blocked energy pathways inside of your ability to feel, certain thoughts that require you to feel that particular thing cannot permeate that particular space. Yeah. So, so it's actually, if people understood how the soul actually worked, they would understand that as soon as you have an emotion that you store inside of yourself, that emotion permeates its own belief systems. It, it firstly stops or it disallows. Precludes. Precludes is mm-hmm. the word we've used in our human soul discussions. The, the precludes the absorption of a new truth on that same subject. But not only that, it, it precludes you actually expressing yourself in truth on that subject mm. as well. So it not only precludes what enters you, mm-hmm. it also prevents what exits you from being truthful as well. Mm. So this is where a lot of people don't even understand that a lot of their questions are not even real questions. Yeah. They're driven by the desire of ala- continuing to preclude truth inside their soul. And in frequent discussions with Sandra, I have found that to be the case where she does not want to feel the truth, does not want to get a truthful answer. And in fact, what she really wants from me is to give her an answer that supports her unloving soul-based condition in that regard. So I'm not judging her there. I'm just saying that there are certain emotions that she has that precludes her from truth entering her and precludes her from even asking a question that is going to confront (laughs) the condition she's in. So that's, this yes. is a problem that every person on this planet faces, is, a, is that the soul-based emotions preclude logic from operating in certain areas unless we are willing to address the emotion, which is the reason why we've had so many discussions about emotions, <laughs> yeah. unless we're willing to address the emotion, we are incapable of any logic on that mm. particular subject, completely incapable even though we may be intellectually clever. (laughs) Uh, Is there a distinction, though, between I have an emotion within me that uh, that I desire, because desire is always the catalyst for change in our soul, isn't it? Exactly. So that I desire to hold on to and I desire to support, then it's precluded. And any question I ask you is not really sincere. And I'll never re- it will never really challenge the state within me about that issue. And you can tell that is your desire by how angry you get when somebody <laughs> does tell you the truth. <laughs> that makes sense. I concur. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but then there's another scenario, isn't there, where I'm, I've got this preclusion situation happening inside of me, but I'm developing and growing a desire to change. But even then, that requires first a desire to release emotions that preclude the change. Yes. So so faith in the emotional process has to begin mm-hmm. this process. And most people who listen to Divine Truth still do not have faith yeah. in the emotional process. They still try to do everything else other than yeah. the emotional process. So, so this is a very important thing to understand. While we do that, while we don't have faith in the emotional process, we are going to be in a state where our logic is continually flawed. Yeah. And the best thing to do, I've found personally, is go, yep, yeah, I'm going to be flawed there and I'm <laughs> going to be flawed there. So what's the point of even trying to think about that? Yeah. I just need to focus, firstly, my attention on 
dealing with the emotions that I know cause the flaws yeah. and having a desire to deal with those particular emotions, now when some truth comes to me, I will be able to experience some logic on the matter. Mm. Mm. So even though this section is entitled How Spirits Can Influence My Logic, really we've just established that I am the dominant cause of a lack of logic within myself. Exactly. It's really my emotional condition that allows spirits to influence my logic, <laughs> yeah. just like it allows anything else to influence my logic. Yeah. So, so we can't say that, that it's some other thing outside of us that causes these things. It is within us this emotional desire to have a different logic, mm -hmm. to have a different way of seeing it than God has. Mm -hmm. And this is a frequent problem that we have. We want to see things differently to what God sees them. We justify seeing things differently to what God sees them. Even though it causes us pain, we continue to do it. Now, now most of us have learned to do that from childhood. And when I say most, all have learned to do it from childhood. And it's only by going through a process of release yeah. that we can actually get out of that condition. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll just quickly run through a few points that we made specifically for sure. Sandra, but sure. I feel you've answered it really well. Um, so Sandra is addicted to the messages that spirits tell her. Uh, that doing things God's way, for example, forgiving in this case, is actually going to harm her. This is because she doesn't want to feel her personal fears and, most crucially, she desires for other people to support her in her fears. So other people, you, me, people on earth and spirits, she really wants them. Exactly, and that's why these spirits can communicate these kind of messages to her. And in, in a way, these spirits are just responding to a desire which is already within her. That's right. And, and it's interesting that whenever I attempt to confront that desire in Sandra, she's angry with me straight away. So, so as soon as I say, you shouldn't be listening to this kind of thing, she, wa she wants to listen to it. Mm -hmm. she, she, she's demonstrated that by getting angry with the person who's saying, you don't have to listen to that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Sandra's holding on to a lot of anger about injustice and fear uh, in a variety of areas in her life. She doesn't want to feel those emotions despite, as you just mentioned, the direct personal feedback from both of us actually mm. pointing out the exact problem that exactly. she's having. Yeah. Exactly. And her logic will constantly try to avoid the exact problem in, yeah. the, in any discussion. So every discussion we've ever had with Sandra, she always tries to use logic to avoid what we're saying to her. Yeah. But it's her logic, which is flawed because it's not God's opinion, it's what it's the preclusion emotions in her soul driving all of her logic. Yes. And, and until she releases those emotions, her logic is going to remain flawed. Exactly. Mm. And we should, as you've already mentioned, say that Sandra is not alone in this situation. Not at us. all. In fact, no. every person on the planet has the same problem to yeah. a degree, some to a higher extreme than others. Yeah. But everybody has the problem where our logic is not as logical as it could be. You know, and, and it's only by releasing fear that our logic becomes more logical. logical. More real. <laughs> more, more. Well, well, it's not even just more real, it's factual, more factual. That's what I mean, yeah. See, see we have had logic. discussions with spirits recently about the difference between logic and fact. Fact is what is it what is. It's what is God's truth about the matter. That's fact. So, so if you don't have God's truth about the matter, then you're not being logical from God's perspective. So logic is frequently just what you want to believe supported by your intellectual reasoning. That's usually what people call logic yeah. is, is usually all it is. Mm -hmm. It's not actual fact. What we want is that when we, logic can help us arrive at facts, mm -hmm. but, but spirits and people on earth who support us in our unloving condition usually have codependent addictions with us to do so. They don't want us to know the facts. They don't even want us to know the facts of why they want us to do things for yeah. them. They don't even want to know that, ask to know that. So, so, you know, there is a strong desire on most people on earth to not know the facts, mm -hmm. to not know the facts as God sees them. And this is our primary problem. Mm -hmm. and, and our logic should assist us to find those facts. Yeah. But because we have flaws in our emotional condition, we finish up using logic to support our flaws. 
and that's not real logic and it's often frequently flawed what I classify as forward logic or totally illogical actually yeah but but that's what we do to support our false belief systems it's, to prevent us from feeling emotions yeah it's interesting isn't it it's sort of like when I have true logic it serves not just me but everyone that's right. when I have this sort of flawed thing that I like to call logic it's all self-serving isn't it yes and the, and the primary self-service is to avoid specific personal emotions. Yeah. That's the primary self-service. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a very selfish process and it's very hard often talking to a person who's in that state because they're all always selfishly going back to why they want to believe what they want to believe because it supports them not having to feel something or having to feel something, you know, depending on yeah, you yeah, know, what yeah. they're trying to avoid. You know, yeah. On one hand, they might not wish to feel like sadness but on the other hand, they want to maybe they want to have a sexual feeling that mm -hmm. they should be more circumspect about, you know, yeah. uh, either way, uh, they have addictions that they would be justifying through this process. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that that's the case. And spirits can only do the influence over us and give us thoughts and feelings in harmony with what we would like to maintain in terms of belief systems yes and and maintain in terms of emotional conditions mm -hmm. so so they're not they're not going to have any other influence other than that so yeah. so any person who is spirit influenced like sandra is and like i said she has been since childhood obviously there are strong codependencies yes that are maintaining the relationship absolutely mm. so that whole situation for sandra means that um, all of those unhealed emotions and desires drive all of her questions and she's addicted, very addicted to having someone engage with her in that false reasoning and to commiserate really with her not changing and remaining in this very... Well, passive. firstly, she's addicted to engagement, period. Yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> full stop. Full yeah. stop. There, yeah. There's obviously issues there in a child where, where she wasn't listened to, wasn't recognised, wasn't noticed, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So that's one issue. And this is why she wants spirits around her all the time who engage with her all the time, because that way she gets a permanent feeling that she's with somebody and enga somebody's engaging with her. So that's one of the issues. Yeah. Another issue is, is, is she, yes, as you say, she wants her false beliefs supported, particularly her false beliefs about fears. So all the spirits do is just tell her a whole heap of things that she needs to be afraid of, yeah. uh, even though none of those things have actually happened to her yes. uh, yet, in most cases, mm -hmm. you know. They basically indicate that they're going to, and so this causes her to stay in a state where she doesn't have to act and so forth. So there's another addiction, not needing to act, not mm -hmm. needing to do something that's moral or loving or ethical because, oh, my fear is a justification mm -hmm. to not do it. And in this case, she's really saying, I, it's, I can't forgive because it's just going to be too bad and too fearful. And I'm going to end up in hell, she's saying. Yeah. It's completely the opposite. Yeah. She's worried she's going to end up in hell if she forgives. Yeah. The reality is she's going to end up in hell if she doesn't. Yeah. So that, that's interesting. It is Even interesting. In, so you can see how warped the logic is. Yeah. And the spirits obviously are feeding this logic. Yes. You can see how warped their logic is yes. as well. Yeah. Now, why are they feeding that kind of logic? Well, there's all sorts of motivations for them to do so. Mm -hmm. Keeping somebody on earth in a state of fear means you have control over them. Yeah. If you've got control over them, you can get them to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to get them to do. Yes. And therefore experience things through them that you wouldn't normally be able to experience. So there's a whole heap of motivations for doing this on their part. But what we're trying to do here is address the motivations on Sandra's part. Yes, and people who, a lot of people who have these same kind of motivations. Yes. I think crucially, just to like, I'll just summarise both of the last points that we had. Mm -hmm. One of them is that, um, as you've mentioned clearly, Sandra's not challenging her addictions and she just lives in these feelings of like, uh, it's not fair, you know, I'm attacked and persecuted and I'm justified in staying unloving because other people are unloving. There's a lot of angry rationalisation of her own unloving state and maintaining it and perpetuating it. Yes. Because she's in this state, the feedback that we present and give means that she doesn't receive that and use it to strengthen her desires, to help her adjust her will, to basically 
take on more personal responsibility. And I really wanted to highlight or that Or develop point. faith, which or is a really key thing. Yeah. That's the key thing. Yeah, to mm. develop faith. Mm. I, and I see that's a problem that a lot of people have, that um, truth that's presented isn't being taken on as a, a, an asset or something that's going to help me develop and grow because there's a lot of this angry justification of like, it's not fair and I don't want to. Or even just, you know, I'm not ready to do that yeah, yet. Yeah, I'll do it in my own time. I'm going to do it in my own yeah. time. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Like, so, so you're basically saying you're going to become loving in your own time. Well, that's true, you are. But you're going to put off the opportunity you've just been offered, really? Yeah. And as I said to someone in private yesterday, um, God's way is not like that. It's not, it's not Mary's way or Jesus' way or someone else's way. It, it, when we do it our way, the, we're just as likely to put off to making that loving choice for as long as humanly possible. God's laws and God's way is presenting to us the opportunity right now. God, that means God's saying you're ready right now to make a different choice. And and accepting God's way means accepting that and and feel being ready to feel overwhelmed and challenged and not yeah. ready and unprepared. But we also need to look at the the terrible lack of logic involved in putting something off. Yes. Because <laughs> like, it, it is an absolutely <laughs> is. stupid thing to do. Like every one of God's laws is about helping you become happier. Mm -hmm. So all you're doing whenever you say, I'm going to do it in my time, you're saying, I'm going to stay unhappy for as long as I want, thank you. Yeah. Now, what a silly self, like, it's a self-attacking thing to do. Yeah. But we do it. We basically are saying, I'm going to stay as unloving as I want to be and as unhappy as I want to be for as long as I want to be. And, and when you look at that kind of attitude, there's a lot of rage in that. You know, there's a lot of anger in that. So while somebody might couch it in the terms of, oh, I'll just do it in my own time, mm -hmm. really that's what they're saying. My first thing yeah. is what they're, for, they're really saying. Yeah. They're really saying, no, damn it, I'm yeah. going to do, I'm going to take, a, I'm going to be unhappy as I want to be mm -hmm. and live in my addictions for as long as I want to. Thank you very much. Right? Yeah. And while that is a basic truth, you are going to do it for as long as you want to. Mm -hmm. Right. At the end of the day, is that your best course of action? Yeah. Probably not, right? So, and it's not very logical, is it? And it's also not very loving, actually, yeah, yeah. to yourself or other people. Yeah. So, so these kind of attitudes, while they might be couched in quite innocent terms mm -hmm. and be said with a lot of what I would classify as silky smoothness, yes. you know, which, yes. is, which is frequently people will say them quite rapidly, yeah. you know, and silky smooth as if they're doing you a favour even, you know, yeah. or as if you allowing them to do something in their own time is doing them a favour. Yeah. And God's laws are basically saying, no, do it now, do it now, do it now because you'll be happier. Do it now because it's going to be better. Do it now because you're going to be happier sooner. Yeah. You know, that's what really God's laws are saying. But everybody wants to go, no, then I don't have the right to stay unhappy you know? <laughs> <laughs> for as long as I want to stay unhappy. <laughs> Basically, that's what we're arguing yeah. for. Yeah. And, um, and that is, uh, you know, that's our version of love. Yeah. Our version of love is I should be able to stay as unhappy as I, and, as, and as unloving as I want to be in my addictions for as long as I want to. Mm -hmm. Now, what a terrible flaw yeah. that is in our version of love yeah. to believe such a thing. God's laws are all trying to correct that very big flaw. Mm -hmm. You're better off living in harmony with the law than you are doing that. Yeah. Mm. And that is very topical for the rest of our discussion because Sandra is basically saying, uh, I'm going to put off forgiveness for as long as I can. And actually forgiving is going to make life better for other people and I don't want that. And so, it's going to make it worse for me. I want misery for me and for <laughs> them for as long as possible. No, Sandra's faith at the moment is that basically if she forgives her life's going to get worse other people's life's going to get better and she's going to have a relationship with god that's her that's what she believes if she doesn't forgive now almost mm. every one of those statements are completely the opposite of truth yeah if she doesn't forgive the reality is she is going to be get herself in a worse condition she's going to be more unhappy mm -hmm. Other people are, you know, going to benefit from her forgiving as well, obviously. Yeah. But the biggest thing is she's going to be able to have a relationship with God. Yeah. 
So sorry, let's let's recap that because I think we got a bit turned around. If she doesn't forgive, yep. she believes she's going to be happier. She'll be able to connect to God and other people uh, will... Well, she wants to punish other people. Yeah. She wants she, to make them pay for what they do. They'll pay. And they'll, they'll pay if she doesn't forgive is she what she thinks. Forgive. Yes. When reality, if she does forgive... Because all of those things are not correct. No, none of those things are true. In fact, she will be unhappier, won't be able to connect to God. And And other people people pay less. Pay less. If you don't forgive. If she does forgive, then, (laughs) then, you know, other people will be more drawn. Well, they'll, they'll be drawn into paying for the penalty of their sin. Because they'll be able to recognize their sin sooner as we discussed in our principles regarding yes. forgiveness and repentance. And she'll no longer be supporting them. She'll no longer be supporting their their unloving condition, which means her own condition won't degrade because she's supporting others at the moment. Yeah. So there's a whole heap of improvements that exactly. will happen in her life, besides the fact, of course, she'll be able to have a conscience and love connection with God, because that's not possible in this state. Yeah. In this state, all you're doing is justifying unloving perspectives, which are completely the opposite to God's. Yeah. So so everything she believes, she has faith that everything she believes is true, mm-hmm. and yet everything she believes is false yeah. about forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. Now, even that's even after hearing hours and hours of discussion about it and hours and hours of feedback about it. That's mm-hmm. still the case. So, so what's stopping that from entering her? It's not the spirits with her. It's her own emotions precluding her from actually working through this issue logically. Yeah. Right. Unless she deals with those specific emotions that cause her to wish to maintain this flawed viewpoint of forgiveness and repentance, she is not ever going to forgive or repent. Mm-hmm. She won't repent for her own sins and she won't forgive others for theirs. And as a result of that, the law of compensation is going to grind her and grind her until she is now free of the issues, Mm -hmm. right? That's how it works. Mm -hmm. There is no other course of action possible if she remains in this current state. No other course of action is possible. So that's, if you think about it, that's actually should cause a person to pause and go, maybe, maybe it is better for me if I actually develop some desire at least to go through my emotions that stop me from reasoning logically yes and also maybe it is better for me to have some faith that god is good and if i engage god's processes in the way that god suggests to do them that will always end up to the benefit of my welfare and the welfare of others around me and maybe that's a better thing to believe right but we are so resistive because of our emotions mm. to believing those things. Mm. And that's why we must address our emotions. That's why we've presented so much material about emotions. Yeah. We must address our emotions if we're going to have any clarity on these matters. Mm.